So if anybody doesn't know, this has been around for a long time, this argument of there being two separate creation accounts. Um, in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, they kind of get the order mixed up. Um, so I have it here, but I'm actually just going to pull it up on the skeptics website. So if you give me a second, I will do that and we'll get started. All right, so I just kind of did an in, uh, intro to this one. Um, okay. I don't know if you had time to look at it beforehand, but... I did. I did. Okay. Sorry. My uh, my son needed me. <laughs> oh, you're fine. Kids. Yep. Um... Where is did, did you already did you already read it? I'm sorry. Um, no, I didn't already read it. So actually, you can go ahead. I'm trying to find the article that it comes from. So you can go ahead and read it if you want. Okay, hold on. Let me I got to send this text. Where as you can see, we're uh, seasoned professionals here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, so if David Wood can do a five hour stream where he talks about all kinds of stuff with AP, then so can we, right? Right. Okay, so we're on the, the number 11. <clears throat> number 11. So it was the two uh, so-called contradictory uh, creation accounts. Yes. So we've got... Uh... Okay, so we've got... Genesis 1... 25 through 27 um but you've got it up on the on the screen so so basically it comes down to um <clears throat> with, where, when were the animals formed so in the first one you've got uh the animals are formed then god created man and then then the um the second example you've got um God forming every beast of the field and every bird of the air. He brought them mm -hmm. to the man. So the man was made, and then all of these animals are brought to him to be named. Right. So, so I've got a couple things about that that I thought were interesting. Well, you know, on face value, it does look like there's an issue. Um but I noticed that the that it uses different words. So in Genesis one, you've got that God made the beasts of the earth. Um, well, I mean, hold, hold on. I guess, I guess let's back up. So the first one, Genesis one, is basically the creation story of the world, and then mm -hmm. Genesis two is basically kind of zooming in on the creation of man and woman. Right. <clears throat> um so one is basically adding details that the other one didn't add um so so yeah i mean back on back to the the verbiage here it's like you've got made in genesis one uh it's like mm -hmm. god made the beasts of the earth let us make man in our image um so god created man in his own image but then in genesis 2 it says that god formed every beast of the field um <clears throat> so i thought it was interesting that you've got you've got these two different verbs uh make and form um so i was curious um because god formed these creatures before man does that mean that he hadn't already created them that's kind of like the implication is that they weren't already created when they were being formed before man um so I kind of saw it as like you've got all all of these creatures have already been created, but then they're being presented to to Adam to be named. Mm -hmm. Um kind of like how we would how we're presenting this the screen with the text on it. You know, if if you were to put up different animals, like a slideshow of animals, you would be presenting them to me to be named or whatever, you know, if, if I was Adam in the example. But right. that doesn't that doesn't mean that the like if you showed if you popped up a, on the screen an elephant that doesn't mean that the elephant didn't already exist you're just showing an example of this creature what would you name this so that's kind of how i saw it was that 
God was forming these creatures for Adam to to name. That didn't necessarily mean that they didn't already exist. Yeah, that's kind of the track that I took. I found a really good video on it from Inspiring Philosophy. Um, and actually, I linked that in the description for anybody that wants to look at it. It's at the bottom of the description box. Um, he had a bunch of notes on this. Let's see. <clears throat> Yeah, he suggests that Genesis 1 is an account of creation in a general sense, kind of like what you said, including the creation of the world, God's sovereignty, and general proclamations for humanity. But Genesis 2 acts kind of as a sequel to that, which accounts for creation in a specific sense, including mankind's relationship to God, the location of man in the garden, and how man is supposed to live in the world. So if you actually just go to Genesis 2... Let's see. Yeah, the start of Genesis 2 is the seventh day, and then man and woman in the garden, and God is uh, forming man. Sorry, is that? Yeah, he formed man and then brought him all the animals and stuff like that. Right. Um, yeah, when I looked it up, I, I did a word study in um, the logo software. And Sweet. which is super helpful for stuff like this. Um, so, you know, so, so make um, or, or the, the, the Hebrew word asa um, means to do or to make, but then form yet sar was um, meant form or fashion as a potter would clay. So I thought it was interesting that the, the word that they're using is that he's, he's shaping mm -hmm. these, he's shaping these creatures before Adam. Um, but the same word is used for Adam, that Adam was formed from the dust of the earth. So, but the difference was, um, it says that God breathed, uh, the breath of life into him. So where was, where was the word make being used there? Um, let's see, make, uh, God made the beasts of the earth in Genesis okay. 125, but then in Genesis two, it says God formed every beast of the field and, and every bird of the air. Um, so, you know, the, so the same word is it used, but it is, but formed was used in the context of man being created, mm. but the difference was that God, but it, it adds the, the, um, the clarification that, that, uh, God breathed the breath of life into, into man, but it doesn't say that in this case. Mm. So it makes me, you know, and, and, and someone could argue, well, but it says every beast of the field and every bird of the air. So that must be all, all of them. But, you know, um, I like to go to car shows and, uh, and they have every, you know, 2024 vehicle on display, but that doesn't mean that they have every, you know, every Honda Accord that they're going to make in 2024 in that right. one building, you know, they just have a representation of each, you know, <laughs> of each car that they're putting on display. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like God formed the, what would you say, the species of animals in Genesis mm -hmm. 1 and then either formed or brought um, individual representatives of those animals for adam to name right that's that's kind of how i see it yeah that's that works that's an explanation um there's some other stuff surrounding genesis 1 and 2 that i wanted to get into as well because there's this thing called the documentary hypothesis hmm. which is kind of like a critical look at genesis 1 and 2 and i'm not super informed on it but it's essentially saying that um they're What's the word? There's some contrivance going on, at least with Genesis 1 and 2, where it's not like, well, actually, I think I have something on it here. Rather than just pontificating on it, I should probably just read it. Um, yeah. So there's some parallel themes going on between Genesis 1 and the rest of the Pentateuch, or sorry, Genesis 2 and the rest of the Pentateuch, indicating that Genesis 2 was not picked apart and combined with Genesis 1. So... I think it's saying that there's like some other source that was picked apart and then combined with Genesis 1 to make Genesis 2. And there's that's this do documentary hypothesis. 
but the response to that says, no, they're both from the same source, or the same person wrote Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Um, it wasn't just from some other source that was, you know, taken apart. And the reason that we can see that is because there's these parallels between Genesis 2 and the rest of the Pentateuch, where if it was taken apart from some other source, the chances of it having all these parallels with the rest of the Pentateuch is very slim. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I have a list of some examples. Um, and this is kind of a different issue from whether Genesis 1 and 2 contradict, but I think it's just interesting, and this is about the only time I'll be able to share it. So mm -hmm. um, let me know your thoughts on this kind of stuff. So some parallels sure. include the tree of life being similar to the lampstand in the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. So you think about if it is actually Moses writing this stuff, the whole Pentateuch, you have the account of creation and you have the law and all that stuff. In the law is all these rules and things for making the tabernacle. And if Moses is writing both of these, maybe there's going to be some parallels there. So the tree of life seems similar to the lampstand in the tabernacle. The trees in the center of the garden parallel the ark being in the center of the tabernacle. So the holiest place where the tree of life is in the Garden of Eden parallels the Holy of Holies in the um, center of the tabernacle. Moses and Aaron had to wait seven days before being allowed in the presence of God in the tabernacle. They had to be ordained. It's like a an eight day process where they're or they're ordained for seven days, and then on the eighth day they can go in. Mm -hmm. And Adam was brought into the garden after seven days of creation. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Right. Yeah. Um, what? Uh, there's, there's some more, what, but go ahead. What What was his name? Um, IP Inspiring yeah. Philosophy. Michael so, Jones. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he um, he calls it a um, a temple inauguration. Mm -hmm. Which is a I, well, I'd never which part the the Moses and Aaron thing or Adam uh, or both. But the, uh, the creation story. So okay. Um, I like that. So yeah, he has a really interesting take on it. I'd, I'd never heard it before until I heard it from him, um, and I think he mentions it in the video that you were uh, that you put the link to. Mm. I like that. That's mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. If yeah. Men are supposed to be the priests, essentially. Well, everybody's a priest in Christ, but if we're talking mm -hmm. about the Old Testament, the man being the head of the woman, Adam being essentially the priest version. Uh, prior to Moses, between him and Adam and Eve, that seems to parallel the idea of there being a priest in the tabernacle. Uh, Adam would be the priest in Eden, mm -hmm. and so you could mm -hmm. call it a temple or ordination. That makes sense. Right, right. Um, oh, the fall of Adam and Eve parallels the deaths of Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus. So... Nadab and Abihu, or Abihu, or however you want to pronounce it, um, if I remember correctly, they had censers that they brought before the Lord with incense in them, but it was not holy. They did it in a wrong way. Um, it was not properly sanctified. And so the Lord essentially burned them up in fire. Um, I gotta be honest, I don't remember where the parallel is that Michael makes there but perhaps it's like there's an uncleanliness that needs to be purged from the presence of god so moses is able to go up to the presence of god and aaron and they have all these things that they have to do to make themselves sanctified before god's presence otherwise they die adam and eve on the other hand started out being able to be in god's presence then they sin then they have to be separated from god right? Because God cannot live with sin. Mm -hmm. So they're removed from the garden. Um, and they have a spiritual death. It's not a physical death like Nadab and Abihu. Mm -hmm. Abihu. Um, but it's still some kind of death there. So that is, that's from Genesis 2, mm -hmm. not Genesis 1, right? And it parallels right. something in Leviticus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting too that they were, in both cases, they were they were chosen and and um, and placed in the holy place, um, 
like Adam wasn't created in in the garden. Um, mm -hmm. That he was. Um, he was placed into the garden. He was placed. Right. 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 Yeah, it's a good point. Um, usually, growing up at least, and I'm sure I'm not alone on this. My thought was, um, Adam is created. Well, it's a, it's talking about this whole creation story, and you've got the garden there and everything. And I just picture God going into the garden and like taking some dust, forming some clay. Boom, you got Adam, right? But instead, it's actually he creates Adam separate from the garden and then puts him in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like those kinds of things that you kind of skip over mm -hmm. um, or you don't remember much from maybe when you learned about it as a kid or the first time you read the Bible or whatever, and then somebody um, tells you it. And it's like, oh my gosh, how did right. I not notice that? Right. How did I not right. notice that he put Adam into the garden? Right. Yeah. Um, let's see. I got some more parallels here. Adam and Eve covering themselves with clothes parallels the priests need to cover themselves in proper garments when in God's presence in the tabernacle. Hmm. So if we're thinking about it, I like that you brought up the whole temple ordination thing. Because if you're thinking about Eden as a sort of temple, um, there's start to be a lot of parallels between that and um, the tabernacle. This is one of them, obviously. Mm. Yeah, it's just so. interesting in Adam and Eve's case that they cover their self with a thing that brought them um, shame in a way. The, uh, hmm. You know, they ate from a tree and then they covered themselves with the product of a tree. Yeah. I wonder, I don't think it says whether it comes from the same tree. Right. I, th not, I, but I think I think it says a know. fig tree, but it's still, oh, okay. but it's still tree. There's a tree connection there. Yeah. And if they have to cover themselves now because of their shame, right? Mm -hmm. And their mm -hmm. shame, their shame causes them not to be able to be innocent in the presence mm -hmm. of God the same kind of parallels going on with the tabernacle where the priest, if he's not doing all this stuff right, will go in there and just, he's dead, right? Mm -hmm. Just boom, gone. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he'll just be incinerated, but you know, the idea is you cannot be in the presence of God and survive because we're all sinners. Right. Um, well, it's and neat there that needs there's... to be some kind of covering there. Sorry, go ahead. Right, right. Well, it's, it's interesting that there's this thread that's, connects us to to the trees um not to sound like a like a tree hugger but uh you know the the fact that there's the tree of life in the garden they ate from the tree of uh the knowledge of good and evil and then mm. in their shame they covered themselves with the part of a of a tree and then you know fast forward to when jesus died on a tree and it's that reconciliation with us where we get to reconnect with that the tree of life um so it's just interesting that there's this there's this thread of uh reconciliation <clears throat> yeah i wish more people could see that <laughs> it's it's redemption and reconciliation is all throughout the old testament mm -hmm. and it's all pointing to a certain person that we happen to know about <laughs> Right, right. Anyway. Well, it makes it, it makes it easy for you know Christians because we're looking at things. You know, it's like uh, what do they say? Looking into the past. You know, twenty twenty. Um, what whatever the saying is. Uh, hindsight is twenty twenty. Hinds hindsight. That's the yeah. That's go. the word I was looking for. Um, you know, where the Jews at the time, you know, they're they're trying to figure out well who who is this mystery Messiah. And then here we are, you know, 2000 years later reading Isaiah 53 and we're like, well, who else could it be? <laughs> you know, yeah, it, yeah. it seems, it seems obvious to us because we're looking, we're looking backwards. Um, or Psalm 22. Oh my right. gosh, just read it. Mm. Um, here's a tidbit. You probably already know this, but the audience might not. Um, I just shared this with somebody the other day when Jesus says, on the cross, um, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, I used to think that that was 
Jesus despairing. Mm -hmm. That he was like, finally, this is the end. This is where the curse, or this is where he becomes a curse. This is where God finally pours out his wrath upon him. So Jesus finally despairs. But that doesn't really make sense because we despair when we are separated from God and Jesus is God. So he can't really be separated from God. Mm -hmm. um, and I always wondered about that. Like, what does that actually mean? And then it was made very, very obvious to me. Um, I think I got it from Mike Winger, actually, where he says, imagine this. Um, you're walking down the street. Well, he didn't say this part. I'm making this part up. But um, you're walking, walking down the street and you hear somebody whistling a tune. And it's the first line of a song that you really like. And just by hearing that whistling, like the whole song pops into your head, right? Because mm -hmm. that's how songs tend to work. Right. Um, I could say, hit me baby one more time. And now you've got a whole song stuck in your head. <laughs> right. Um, it's the same. It, it's the same way with the Psalms or Proverbs or something like that in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. They didn't have numbers. The numbering system right. came way later on, right? So they mm -hmm. went by phrases. If mm -hmm. you said a certain phrase, you could point somebody back to a certain Psalm. And um, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me happens to be, you know, coincidence, mm. happens to be the first line of Psalm 22. Right. You can go and it says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then it says all these other kinds of things that line up perfectly with the Messiah being crucified on the cross. Mm. It's amazing. Yeah. If he would have yelled out Psalm 22, they would have been like, what what is what does that mean? You know, like yeah. they didn't the num <laughs> they didn't have the numbering system like we do today. He'd be so, like, yeah, that's for my people, fifteen hundred years from now, but not you guys. Right, right. <laughs> but the but the people of the time, they would have known exactly what he was saying. Yeah, um, I just wanted to pull it up real quick. Psalm twenty two says things like, well, first of all, the first line is, "My God, my God, why have you forsaken me?" But it says things like, uh. <laughs> something about it, not a bone was broken his mm -hmm. his heart is melted and and i'm like wax or yes i think well you might be mixing that in isaiah 53 but here i am poured out like water all my bones are disjointed and mm -hmm. that's something that does happen when you're on the cross your bone your bones get disjointed my heart is like wax it melts away within me when they stabbed jesus um blood and water came out which meant that the liquid in the heart was separating, which is um, an indication of death. It's like mm. his heart is melting. Mm. My strength is dried up like a pot shard, pot, sh or part, pot shard. Um, my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. He was dehydrated. Um, these are symptoms of something called a hypovolemic shock. Mm. Uh, I was just on a flight uh, last week um, and happened to be sitting next to a nursing student. Actually, I think she was a um, physician's assistant. And she happened to be going through some slides on different kinds of um, like shocks. And one of them was hypovolemic shock. So I got to ask her about it. And it's when, it's when you have a, a large loss of blood, which is what would happen if you are um, whipped like Jesus was and then nailed to a cross and all that kind of stuff. Mm. So these symptoms are symptoms of hypovol hypovolemic shock. Um, oh shoot, there's, ah, yes, this one, verse 18, they divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. That's something that's directly said to have happened after Jesus was crucified. So I can right. go on, but you have all this stuff that's pointing right to his crucifixion in Psalm 22 and people can pull that up just because of the first line that he says. So right. anyway, that tangent aside, there's one more parallel between Genesis two and the, and um, the rest of the Pentateuch, the mm -hmm. cherubim that guarded the Garden of Eden. Remember when um, Adam and Eve are kicked out, there's cherubim that um, guard it and they're given, you know, there's a flaming sword and the cherubim are themselves also given swords, I think. Um, those cherubim are woven into the veils in the tabernacle that guarded the ark. So in the description of the ark, when... Um, God is detailing how this thing should be made. One of the things that they're required to do with the veils is to um, essentially sew cherubim into it, which are 
guarding the holiest place of God and also did that in the Garden of Eden. Right. These kinds of things just make me smile because it's amazing how much they parallel each other. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. the um, Like the temple, the artwork in the temple, it all is a throwback to Eden. Mm-hmm. Um, There's an interesting book, by the way. This is, um, I think, uh, IP mentions it in that video. And I thought, oh, that's cool. I just I just picked that book up. Can you hold it up closer? It's, to uh, the, the Temple and the Church's Mission. Interesting. Who's that by? It is by uh, G.K. Beale, um, edited by D.A. Carson. Can you but, give uh, me an overview of what he used that for? Was that just his source for that video, or one of the? It sources? was. It was a source for one of the points that he was making. Because he he kind of in that video he makes uh he makes he makes several points. Um, mm-hmm. but this was uh this was a reference that he had cited for for uh for one of the points that he was making. Nice. Um. Okay. So those parallels. Here's the point of all those parallels that I wanted to bring up now that we've been talking for half an hour. Um, Genesis 2 has a lot of parallels between itself and the rest of the Pentateuch. The documentary hypothesis um, says that Genesis 2 came from some other source, or it was an amalgamation of another source in Genesis 1. Mm. If that's the case, these parallels are like the most improbable thing to have happened because there's so many of them um there's a lot of other things that i'm going to bring up in just a second where if these things are not something written by the same person who wrote genesis 1 then it's like the best dice roll in history the odds of that happening are so so low so the idea is okay we can reasonably assume that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are written by the same person or written within the same context or whatever, especially in the context of the Pentateuch. If that's the case, it's very unlikely that they would be directly contradictory Hmm. if they're written by the same person. If you think about it, somebody writes a book nowadays, if they have two separate chapters right next to each other, it's kind of unlikely that they're going to have things in there that directly contradict each other. Mm Mm-hmm especially if it's the foundation for an entire religion and people group, right? Right. And someone who claims to be getting their words from the living God. It's very unlikely that there's going to be contradiction there. And when you start there, you can look at this and go, well, maybe it's not a direct contradiction. Maybe there's some some other explanation that we have here. Maybe just lit- reading it literally like woodenly literally like the skeptic does is not the best way to go about this right right and so when we start thinking like that we get to the um, results that you and i just talked about Mm -hmm. where maybe maybe god created all the animals and then created special ones or represent representative ones for adam to name Mm -hmm. it's possible right that doesn't have to be the answer, but it's a possible answer, and it's more reasonable given the whole context than saying it's just a contradiction. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, it makes more sense to me that he would have formed a representative. I mean, because are they arguing that what it's saying is that he created like millions of cr- creatures? You know, because it's, um, you know, it because how many bird, how many, um, how many lions does he need to see to name a lion? You know, because if you're taking it literally, then it's like he made all of the lions on the planet at that moment. That mm. doesn't make that doesn't make any sense. Good does point. he need? Does Adam need to see all of the lions on the planet to be able to say that's a lion? You know, <laughs> he only needs to see. He'd only need to see one. So it makes right. more. It makes more. So that argument to me just doesn't hold water. It makes more sense to me that there's a representative of the lion that's being presented and then it's getting named and that there's a, you yeah. know, the, the planet already has all of the lions made because it says so in the previous chapter. Mm-hmm. Um, here's another interesting thing between Genesis one and Genesis two, there are 70 designations that God makes, meaning 
70 things that God designs. 35 of them are in Genesis 1, and 35 of them are in Genesis 2. That would indicate, I think, to me, someone who's looking at it with a, a microscope, maybe there's a writer who wrote both of these things and meant for them to be linked together. Because there's 70 of them, which is a very significant number in mm. the Bible, and it's split exactly equally between both books, these designations of God. Maybe mm -hmm. they're meant to be read together, and therefore, maybe they're not directly contradictory. Right. Um, yeah. I just, I want to hammer this over and over and over again. The skeptics who look at this and pull up these contradictions talk about having a literal viewing of the Bible. And they view everything in a woodenly literal way. They don't allow any room for metaphor or whatever else. They just view it woodenly literally, meaning they're not willing to budge and they isolate verses. And that leads to these contradictions. But if you just read them a lot of the times, if you just read the context, those fall apart. Or if you allow for things like metaphor, then they fall apart. Mm -hmm. One thing I like to go back to, Frank Turek says this, is um, Jesus said that he is the door. Does that mean that he has hinges? If we're really going to read this in a literal sense and not allow for any metaphor whatsoever, does that mean that Jesus has hinges? Or it says um, Jesus was willing to gather the Jews up like a, ch a hen gathers her chicks. Does he have feathers? No. <laughs> right. It's a metaphor. Yeah. So we have to allow for those kinds of things because that's how the writers intended it for intended for it to be read. Um, and it oh, seems it seems obvious if if they're I guess if they're being fair with the text I think they would they would have to agree that there's metaphor and uh, that it's that that there's certain parts of the text that aren't intended to be literal, right? Yeah, and if you just read it again, if you just read the Bible, it's gonna come up like that. There's things that we can just intuit when we read the Bible. It's like, oh, yeah, okay, that's a metaphor. No big deal. Um, one last little note here, and then we'll move on to the next one, next contradiction. Uh, Genesis 1 through 3 mirrors Genesis 8 through 9. Um, Genesis 8 through 9 is when um, uh, that's the that's Noah, the beginning of Noah's flood story. Um yeah, many parallels written in order can be drawn between the two sections so that splitting Genesis 1 and 2 up would ruin the parallels. Therefore, the two accounts are meant to be read together and the likelihood they are contradictory instead of complementary is low. This bug, I swear, this bug is going to be the bane of my existence. The critic would likely read Genesis 1 and then 2 as a historical narrative that follows a linear series of events. So Genesis 1 happens, then Genesis 2, therefore contradiction this leads to or sorry this leads to contradictions that were mentioned but there's no indication that it needs to be read that way in summary the explanation of genesis 1 and 2 are not immediately obvious if you just read them sometimes it does seem like that the conclusion is that it works well as a unified narrative which parallels other parts of the pentateuch so the assumption that is contradictory is unreasonable <laughs> 